it's Trish with Mom Jeans and Crime Scenes. I am here with another story for you guys. But before we get going, I just wanted to say, um, make sure that you subscribe and you like and you ring the little bell two times so you get personalized notifications and leave a comment about the story because I want to hear your opinions on it. And yeah, so... Also, I wanted to just say thank you really fast. Um, I just had a really great experience with this so far, and I'm just really thankful, and I don't know. I'm just excited about this journey. I think I say that in every single video, but I mean it every time I say it. Like, I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to share these stories. I think they're very important. Um, the story I'm going to tell you tonight is very, very important to me. Um, it's actually a little bit different from what I've done. It's an unsolved story. And I just, I'm excited to share it with you guys because I believe that we can all make a difference. And I think that, um, yeah, every one of us, like, you guys hold the key to some of these mysteries. And so I think that telling these stories, you guys sharing these stories, it's just, we can make a big, a big difference in the world. So, yeah, I'm really excited. So, um, I am going to talk about... Elizabeth Salgado today. Um, she disappeared in Provo, Utah. Ugh, it was like awful. <laughs> I remember when she disappeared and I, uh, yeah, I can't even tell you. Like it just broke my heart and just watching her story over the last five or six years has, has just been, I don't know, I'm probably going to cry and so just don't mind me, okay, because I get super duper emotional when I talk about Elizabeth. But anyways, I want to get started. So Elizabeth was born in November 1988 um, in Chiapas, Mexico. So she was born to Julio and um, her mom. Her mom's name is Libertad. And she just had this big family. She, she was one of seven children. And they lived in a beautiful, colorful home and just just full of love. Like, you can just see the love that her family has for one another. And I just love it. Like, Elizabeth just, I don't know, she just adored her siblings. She was really, really smart. She, her parents, you can just tell her parents are really, really smart. Grades matter to them. Doing a lot of good in the world matters to them. And Elizabeth 100% took after them that way. So her mom was a chemical engineer and her dad was, um, let's see, he did communications and electronics engineering. So Elizabeth growing up, that's, she wanted to be an engineer of some kind. So she worked really hard to get good grades throughout school. Even her older siblings, she's such an example to her older siblings getting good grades and things like that. And she worked hard so that she could eventually go to a university in Mexico and she could be an industrial engineer. So she worked hard towards that and she ended up like fulfilling that. She um, graduated with really good grades and she was really excited about that adventure. Well, in 2004, they joined the um, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So um, that's the LDS church. And so in a lot of my stories, you probably have heard me talk about the LDS church. Well, this became super important to Elizabeth and her family. And so Elizabeth, she decided she was going to take a break from school for a bit. Um, she'd already graduated. She wanted to go on and get her master's degree, but she decided that first she wanted to serve a mission. And so she did. So she served a mission in, it was Pachuca, Mexico that she went to. And she absolutely loved it. Like she loved sharing the gospel. She loved Meeting people is just something that she just felt like was her calling. And so when she came back from her mission, she started thinking more and more about it. And she's like, I really, you know, I want to be an engineer. I've done really well with school, but I also want to spread the gospel and kind of have a bigger reach to people with this. So she decided she needed to learn English. So she kind of, I think, had this idea of learning English for a while in her mind. And she started to research Provo, Utah, which her she has two uncles that live in Provo, Utah. And Provo happens to be the home of BYU. So BYU, if you're not familiar, there's a lot of LDS kids that go to BYU. 
So she's like, this is perfect. I could go live in Provo. I can learn English. They have a really great, um, it's an ASL school. And she's like, that's perfect. I'll just do that for a little bit and I'll have some family in the area. And so she talked to her family about it. And at first they were really not into it. They were like, uh, we think that you should probably stay home with us here. Like, we really don't want to have you move. Like, they, it kind of scared them. But she was like, Mom, Dad, it's safe. I swear, this is like one of the safest places I can go. And so after some begging and pleading, they were like, okay, we trust you. And they allowed her to kind of chase her dream of learning English so that she could come back. She could learn live in Mexico City. She could spread more about the church. She could do well with her schooling, eventually get her master's degree. Like there would be so much opportunity for her if she learned English. So they were like, we have to let Elizabeth do that. Elizabeth was awarded a scholarship to the Noman Global Language Center in Provo, Utah. And she was so excited. She moved to Utah at the end of March, 2015. So she had moved into some apartments and she, um, I think it was the Branberry Apartments in Provo. And so when she first got there, she was in with some roommates and <laughs> it was not comfortable. Um, her roommates, you know, there was a language barrier. Her roommates were messy. They would have friends at all hours. It was just really hard for her to concentrate. They weren't particularly nice to Elizabeth. So after about 10 days, she's like, I have to move. This is just hard. So she ended up moving into another apartment um, complex, I think within the, the Branberry apartment. So she moved to another one. And again, there was a language barrier with her roommates, but it wasn't as bad this time around. Um, she was able to just kind of stay in her room and her apartment or her neighbors or roommates were kind of um, really good about just doing their own thing. And so while they weren't like the best of friends, they respected each other's spaces. So Elizabeth was able to go in and she could, um, you know, read her, the Bible. She could study her English. She could pray or whatever it was to kind of center herself. She was able to do that. Um, also, while she was in the United States, she was constantly in contact with her family in Mexico, constantly texting her sisters. Um, one sister in particular uh, Sarah, she's always texting her sister, calling her family. I mean, she it would only be a few hours at a time that she wasn't talking to her family. So she, being at that apartment and just be, having it be quiet for her, she was able to just have that contact and it was really good for her. Um, so Elizabeth, even though she didn't really, you know, have friends with her, her um, roommates, she started school and, you know, she made a few friends at school. Um, she also started a job that she was excited about. In fact, her mom didn't really think that she needed to be working, but she really wanted to because she could practice her English. So she was really smart that way. And I think that's really brave because, man, I want to learn Spanish. And like, I always feel so insecure when I like go to speak Spanish. I, I work with a lot of, um, Hispanic people at my work and I'm always like, I am just not even brave enough to say hola to them. And so... I just think it's really cool that she was like willing to go work at this Mexican restaurant and practice her English on customers. Like that's really admirable to me. And I just think that she's so cool that way. So she was like, yeah, I'm going to work. And she loved doing that. And she's going to school. And then also she was way involved with the church and her ward. And I guess there was like a whole group of people that were return missionaries. And a lot of times return missionaries go to like Spanish speaking missions and things like that. So a lot of the guys in her ward knew Spanish. And so that was really exciting for Elizabeth. She had people she could talk to. They really loved her because they could, you know, practice, let her practice her English. And she was just had people she could communicate with and they really like instantly loved her. Also, Elizabeth was really pretty like I say this about like all of my people, but like Elizabeth is, she's gorgeous. She is stunning. And you look at her and like, it's just undeniable. She's beautiful. And so I think that these, like all these return missionaries and men were like, whoa, she's, you know, she's smart. She's fun. She's brave. And she's 
gorgeous. And so she's kind of like this full package. And so a lot of the men were attracted to her. And um, Elizabeth was, you know, I think she's flattered. Uh, according to her friend Mackie Smith, she was really flattered that the guys liked her, but she just wasn't interested in dating. She really wanted to learn her English. She's kind of nervous about really letting a whole lot of people in. You know, she's in a new, a whole new, this is like a whole new world for her. And so she was kind of like, eh, I'm not so sure about dating right now. So she was constantly kind of letting guys down easy, but she was really flattered by the attention that she would get. And she'd get this attention from school and she'd get this attention from um, work as well. So she's just kind of always um, saying no to different guys. So I kind of talked about Elizabeth and she kind of, you know, only had small circles. She didn't, wasn't letting a whole lot of people in. The only people she really went with were her uncles. And then she also spent a little bit of time with a guy named Mackie Smith. Mackie lived in, from what I understand, the same apartments that she lived in. I believe I heard that he also um, knew Spanish. She just felt like she kind of connected with him. And I think that he felt that connection with her. And in every interview I've ever seen of him, he's constantly talking about Elizabeth as if he's known her forever and just what a, an effect he, she had on his life and she had a heart of gold just had nothing but good things to say about Elizabeth so I think um, Mackie is one of the few people that she really let in and trusted so um yeah Mackie just kind of talked about in a lot of his interviews how exciting it was for him to watch her grow and it honestly seemed like things were really going well for Elizabeth in the United States so she was really excited about where things were going. It just looked promising for her. So on April 16th, Elizabeth starts her day off just like she would any other day. Um, she kind of had this like routine that she would stick to and that would like include walking to school, going to school, and then walking home from school. And it was about a two, two mile walk, 30 minute walk. And she really didn't mind doing it but she did this every single day and she would walk the same route. She would text her sister um, as soon as she was out of school and they would text all the way home. And you know, that was just kind of how Elizabeth, so if you knew Elizabeth, you were close to her, you, could, you would know her that that's what she would do. Um, so on April 16th, she text, texted her uncle and she's like, hey uncle, will you take me to the grocery store later tonight? And her uncle's like, oh yeah, of course, I'll take you. Um, I'll come pick you up around five o'clock. We'll go to Walmart and get you some groceries. He's like, no problem. So Elizabeth, um, she leaves school around 1.30 to walk home. Witnesses see her leave school. They see her walk down the street towards her apartments. And her sister sends her a message saying, hey, what, what are you doing? And, her, and she responds, I already left school. And that's it. She, there's no other response from Elizabeth from there on out. And her sister's like, that's really weird because it wasn't warm. It was kind of a cold message. Usually she's really compassionate. Usually she's really sweet in her messages and like lovey. And she continues the conversation while she walks home and that just didn't happen today. So her sister thought that was really, really kind of weird. So it's really important to understand that Elizabeth did get the message that her sister sent asking what she was doing, but the response back to her sister, investigators do not believe it was Elizabeth that responded. It was somebody who knew her habits and knew that she messaged her sister daily. So I think it was somebody just kind of trying to throw her family off. So it's just super important when looking at that message or talking about that message that we understand that it was probably not Elizabeth that sent it. But um, yeah, Elizabeth, sh nobody cares from Elizabeth after that. Around five o'clock, her uncle shows up like he promised to take her to the grocery store. And she, she doesn't come out. And so he goes to the door and he knocks and she's not home yet. And so he's like, that's really peculiar. Like, that's not like Elizabeth. She hasn't, she doesn't seem like she'd be flaky. She's never really flaked before. So he's like, well, maybe she went to Walmart already. So he went to Walmart and looked around for her to see if maybe she was with somebody else. And she's, she's not there. So he's like, okay, well, maybe she picked up a shift at the restaurant. 
So he stops by the restaurant and he's asking like, hey, did Elizabeth have to work today? And they're like, no, Elizabeth, it's her day off. So she's not here. And so he was like, hmm, well, that's weird. Well, meanwhile, in Mexico, her family hasn't been able to get a hold of her and they're getting upset. They're getting worried, like, what has happened to Elizabeth? Like, something's wrong. She hasn't texted her, you know, her mom's like, well, how did she, has she gotten your text messages? And her sister's like, no, she hasn't gotten them yet, but maybe her phone shut off and she's just charging it and she's studying, you know, don't worry, mom, she'll probably call us in the morning and things are going to be fine. Well, the next day rolls around. And nobody has heard from Elizabeth still. Her uncle hasn't heard from her. Um, and so they're starting to get worried. Her uncle goes to her apartment. She's n not there. Um, they call her her other uncle. So they she had two uncles that were living in Provo, um, Rudy and Rosenberg. Um, Rosenberg moved to California. So they call him up and they're like, Elizabeth's missing. We can't find her. So he immediately, he calls the school and the school's like, yeah, she didn't come in today. Well, actually the school wasn't open, but I think somebody was working there because it sounds like he did talk to somebody from the school. And they're like, well, why are you so worried? Like she probably just went to Las Vegas with friends a long weekend. Don't stress out until Monday. If she doesn't show up, then, you know, you start to worry. But like, she's, she's a, a college student. Like she's just probably out with friends. So... I, the, you know, knowing Elizabeth, that just doesn't sound like something she would do. He calls her, you know, they, they start kind of calling around, trying to figure out where she could be. Nobody hears from her. By Monday, she doesn't show up to her classes. She doesn't show up to work. Her uncle in California has called her work and is finding out, like, hey, did she show up? They're like, well, she's scheduled today, but she hasn't come in. And he's like, well, did she call? And they're like, no, she hasn't called, nothing like that. And so he's like, okay, something's wrong. So he flies from California into Utah and they start like really getting serious about trying to figure out what happened to Elizabeth. So at this point, they've called to report her missing and the police are like, well, that's kind of strange. You know, she wouldn't come all the way from Mexico and miss her classes not come into work. So like, that's kind of weird. And so they try pinging her phone to see if maybe they can locate her. Like they're thinking, well, it's possible she's out with friends, you know, but like, it's also possible something weird is up because, you know, some, some things are adding up to them. So they ping her phone and her phone shut off. So they don't get anything. So they're like, hmm. So the officer comes, is dispatched to her apartment. Her roommates don't recall seeing her the whole weekend, so they're like, okay, well, you know, let's go to the school. The officer goes and starts talking and interviewing students. There are students who have not seen her since Thursday, but they witness her walking down the street. And the officer's like, well, this is such a, like, a safe street to walk down. It's really, really busy, first off. Like, like hundreds of people on this street. If somebody was going to kidnap a 26 year old woman, it would cause a scene and somebody would see it. So they're like, well, this is kind of weird. So he kind of travels her route home and he's looking for like cameras or anything like that, that would maybe show, you know, where she went missing or maybe her getting into a car or what could have happened. So he's walking and he sees a camera up on one of the hospitals on the street. And so he's like, perfect. So he goes to talk to the hospital, but bad luck because the camera, which would be normally facing the street, they're actually doing construction on the, the hospital. And so the camera was facing the construction. So they were like, oh man. And there was really nowhere else, which surprises me because there's so much on that street. There are no cameras pointing on the street for her to, you know, see how far she had gotten. So they're thinking, well, it's a really busy street. There's no way, like, it, it's just really hard to believe that somebody pulled over and kidnapped her. Um, you know, a lot of people are thinking, well, maybe she's a victim of trafficking. And, you know, they're like, eh, I mean, it's always possible. But, you know, Provo, there's not a high amount of trafficking in Provo. I mean, there could be some. But also, she, she's 26. And a lot of times they're looking for younger people when they're trafficking. So, I mean... 
while it is poss- a possibility that's what happened to her, they're like, eh, we're not really sure about that. We really think that she got into a car, and this makes sense to me. She got into a car of somebody she trusted. Her circles are small. She's only been there for 18 days, so there's not a whole lot of people that she's going to jump in their car and go with. But, and, and like I said, she wasn't really trusting a whole lot of people. She's only letting a few people into her circle. And she's saying no to a lot of guys' advances. So I think that that's a likely scenario. She got into a car with somebody that she did she did trust. And they drove off with her. And so, yeah, that's what I think is happening so far. So they had a pretty good idea of what she was wearing. And that was a really good start for them. But they would interview people. They weren't getting any any leads. Nobody knew anything that was going on. And, you know, the days start to kind of add up. And so the more time that goes by, the, the more worried that they're getting. Meanwhile, her family is in Mexico, and they're trying to get an emergency visa to come to the United States. And it actually took them 13 days, I believe it was, 12 or 13 days to get that visa. Can you believe that? Like, how horrible it would be so awful to be stuck in a whole different country and knowing that your baby has gone missing and you can't be there to search so this is happening and they're just they feel helpless they have absolutely no idea like what to do from mexico and their daughter is just gone so searchers are kind of investigators are kind of looking to figure out you know what what's happening her uncles start to come up with some theories there is one guy from the school they have just his first name and her uncle tells investigators hey this guy was asking her out making her uncomfortable maybe being a little bit more aggressive than he needed to be and kind of got a little agitated that she wasn't interested in him and so the investigators was amazing with this, just this first name he's able to figure out who it was he was able to locate this guy and he went to talk to him and they separated him from all of his friends and interviewed each of each of them and their stories were all panning out. The day that Elizabeth disappeared, he was actually in classes during that time. Um, he was super cooperative and was quickly ruled out. In fact, almost everybody that they talked to were ruled out quickly. Um, there was a construction worker that they started talking about and this construction worker would hit on her all the time at work and he would say things to her like, you know, why are you working here? I could, I could like, you could quit here and I take care of you. And like, he was just like enamored with her beauty and her cute little personality. And so she was, you know, I think a little bit freaked out about this guy because I mean, he had come on really strong to her and this is a whole new experience for her. So They ended up um, putting the word out to the restaurant to look for this guy. The restaurant knew exactly who it was, and so he he did eventually show up, and police were able to follow him home, and he was really cooperative. He let him him search the home, his car, everything. Like, he was so extremely, like, helpful, and um, his alibi checked out, and they were able to rule him out as a suspect as well, so they were really just getting nowhere. They like interviewed every possible person that they could think of. Um, but you know, Mackie Smith kept talking about all these men who were interested in her and the ward in the congregation. So it's really interesting to me, um, were all the men interviewed? Because we were, you know, we're pretty confident that she got into this car with somebody she knew. So it's really weird to me that you know, they, they have absolutely no idea in this short time period and a small amount of people that they weren't able to narrow it down. So it's just kind of, so soon Elizabeth Smart caught wind about Elizabeth Salgado. And, um, if you have not heard about Elizabeth Smart, I think I've talked about her in other videos. Um, her story is amazing and maybe one day we'll cover it. She was kidnapped when she was 14 years old out of her bed and her face was everywhere like every billboard in every city they her family did such a great job keeping her little face in the media and nine months after she was kidnapped they she was recognized they actually she was disguised like 
all you could, I think, see was just her eyes. But because of all these pictures, she was recognizable. And, and that's how she was rescued. So Elizabeth has done a great job in her life. She's really worked on helping other people who go missing and using her really scary, awful situation and using it to be a positive thing and helping people in that. Something I just love about Elizabeth Smart. And so she was like, we're going to get Elizabeth's, this other Elizabeth's face out there. That's what we have to do. And she really truly was like, I know that she's kidnapped. I feel like she's alive. And we're going to work really hard to get this girl's face out there. And so that's what Elizabeth Smart and her father, Ed Smart, would do. They just were out in the media. They were out helping with searches. They they got her face everywhere. Um, and then there were volunteers, amazing volunteers, who put together searches, who put together vigils and marches and all kinds of things to help help Elizabeth. They'd bring in donations. It was just amazing the amount of support that they had for Elizabeth. And um, I think that it did help having her face out there. Um, I think that, you know, while it didn't really bring a resolution necessarily, but maybe it did. I think that like, you know, seeing her face, somebody knows something, somebody did something. And so I think that, you know, having that memory constantly being brought up, I think it's got to shake you a little bit, but, um, there were lots of searches. There were lots of things going on to keep Elizabeth out there. And, um, she didn't get as much attention as a lot of other people who go missing get, which really broke my heart. But I loved that they were trying to really keep her face in the media. So investigators start to, you know, think about this. Like, okay, so when somebody goes missing, it's usually not like, a lot of times it's not a stranger that goes and kidnaps or takes or hurts somebody. A lot of times it's somebody you know that you're close to or family. So they've interviewed a lot of people. And so they kind of turn their um, inv investigation towards the uncles. And um, the uncles are like, we have nothing to hide. They do um, a voice analysis test. And then the FBI came in and they did a polygraph on the uncles. Well, the polygraph tests don't go so well. In fact, um, Uncle Rudy, he, his polygraph test was inconclusive and then uncle rosenberg his um yeah his test was it was not good it it came back as a fail and um that you know was a little concerning because you know why would they not be able to pass this polygraph test but one thing you have to think about is they were really tired, they probably weren't sleeping very well. They weren't eating very well. They had all this stress. Um, their niece was missing. And every interview I ever saw of these two men, there's so much emotion there um, and anguish. I just, I don't know. I can't, I cannot say that I think that the uncles did something to her, Elizabeth. I really just don't feel like that's the truth. It would shock the heck out of me if it was, if it turned out that they were involved. Um, and I think that the police and investigators felt the exact same way. Um, they did withdraw, you know, a little, like they weren't including the uncles in a lot of the investigation for a little while and, you know, kind of were weirded out about the polygraph test, but they did get, um, they were able to get warrants on their phones and really like dig into all of it and everything checked out and their uncles were actually ruled no longer as suspects and so you know and they kind of said the same thing like they would just be surprised if the uncles had anything to do with elizabeth's you know disappearance but um yeah i think that the the polygraph tests you know they aren't there's a reason why they are not usually you know they you can't be used in trials and things like that because they're not always accurate i think i would fail they'd be like is your name trish and i'd be like <laughs> I think so. Like, I, I don't know. I would be so freaked out. So I could see why maybe they didn't pass. I probably wouldn't pass one either because that, that's like a really scary thing. So um, the only, the really bad thing about that was, is um, that was released to the media. And I remember people had their pitchforks and they were like, the uncles murdered Elizabeth or did something terrible to Elizabeth or sold her into sex trafficking. Like people had all these crazy ideas. And so these poor men who are, really trying to 
just find their niece. They they were being burned at the stake, basically. And people started withdrawing their support. There weren't people coming out and searching anymore. Um, there weren't donations being made anymore. It was just really kind of a hard thing and hard time for the family when they need that support. They need those, you know, people to congregate together to to help find Elizabeth. And all of a sudden, these people are kind of backing off. And it was really just kind of an unfortunate thing. So, yeah, it kind of just makes me feel bad that that happened because they really needed the support. At some point during the investigation, there was a lead and one of her uncles, I think it was, um, I want to say it was Uncle Rosenberg. I think that's who it was. He got a phone call. And this phone call was, they were saying like, hey, we have Elizabeth. We're going to kill her if you don't give us $50,000. And like all these terrible things, like you got to get us this money. So he was like, of course. So he jumps into his car and he rushes to the bank. He is ready to pay whatever ransom these guys need if it means getting his precious little niece back. And he calls the investigators and the investigators are like, do not give anybody any money, you know. And they are able to track this phone call and it actually came from a house in Texas. It was an abandoned house and it was linked to lots of fraudulent activity. So it was just somebody who was just trying to make money off of Elizabeth's disappearance, which is way gross to me. Um, yeah, so... You know, there, that kind of hope was dashed that, that these people did not, in fact, have Elizabeth. And thankfully, they did not pay anybody any money. But it was kind of, I think, you know, one of those things where it's like, oh, dang it. You know, we were so close to getting her back. So a lot of people, like I said before, thought that maybe she was a victim of sex trafficking. And while it's possible, it just felt like it was kind of an unlikely thing. Um, another thing that... Um, that investigators asked her family to do is they asked them to do like DNA swabs. So they um, swabbed her mom and dad. I don't think they swabbed anyone else in her family. But basically the the reason was that they could put their DNA into a database. And so if her her body was found in a different jurisdiction, um, she would be they could identify her. So if she, you know she turned out to be in Idaho or somewhere else, they they would be like, okay, you know, this is Elizabeth. So it was, you know, I think kind of a sad thing to ask for that DNA, but um, it was something that they needed to do just to kind of cover all their grounds because there are a lot of unidentified bodies out there. And so they just want to make sure that that wasn't going to be Elizabeth's story. Um, but I do think that they, you know, they, I think that they thought that they needed to do it, but it was kind of unnecessary because I think that they truly believed that somebody took her you know, that she knew and that she probably wasn't far. So one day they get this, what they think might be a break in the case. And it is really, really sad. They found a suitcase on the side of the road in Utah. And inside of the suitcase, there was a woman's body. And people were like, oh, this could be Elizabeth. So they call um, Elizabeth's investigators and they're like, hey, you know, you should probably come look at this body. It, it appears to be a Hispanic woman. This could be the girl you're looking for. So investigators go t to see, you know, this this woman could possibly be Elizabeth. And, you know, she's wearing a red shirt. She's wearing denim pants. She's got dark hair. Um, and they're like, well, this really might be Elizabeth. And they, they see that she's got a tattoo. And so he goes and asks her family, like, hey, did she have a tattoo? And they're like, no, 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 that's not her thing. And he's like, well... You know, maybe, you know, maybe she got the tattoo without them knowing it. Um, you know, people sometimes do that and will hide tattoos from their families. But um, they did rule out this um, this young lady that was found because she had a surgical scar that Elizabeth did not have. Now, I want to do a story on her. So listen for that because we will do a story on the, the lady that was found in the suitcase. But um, it, it's kind of one of those things that's bittersweet because it's not Elizabeth which is wonderful, but it's somebody else's, somebody else's kid. You know what I mean? Like it's somebody else in that suitcase. So it's just like nobody has answers and somebody else has answers. And it's just, I don't know, it's just sad all around. So um, at this point, you know, there's nothing. Like 
this case kind of grows quiet. Elizabeth's family eventually goes back to Mexico. And even though the case isn't cold, it goes kind of quiet. And yeah, I don't know. It was just really sad. I just remember for a few years just thinking, oh, what happened to Elizabeth? And just uh, thinking about her a lot and like what could have happened to her? And you, you just, you know, you feel it in your heart that something's wrong and that's, you know, she's probably not here with us anymore. And yeah, I don't know. It was just really sad. So Elizabeth's case kind of goes quiet. That is until May of 2018. And a man was driving in Cobble Creek Canyon. And so he, I think he was hunting and he needed to use the restroom. So he pulled off to the side of the room of the, sorry, to the side of the road to find some privacy. And he comes across a, a human skull and bones and like clothing. And so he's like, oh my gosh, I just found a body. So he calls the police. They come and check this out. And um, it doesn't take them terribly long. They're able to get these these remains and they're able to identify them positively as Elizabeth. One of the things about her is that she is missing her teeth. Now, I don't know if her teeth were found with her body or if they're just missing. Like that's something I'm really curious to find out about because yeah, I think that's like a really important part of the whole picture and what happened. But like, yeah, she's missing her front teeth, which indicated that she was probably fighting for her life. But the really weird part about how she was found is um, she was found like they had, whoever had killed her laid her down peacefully, like, like she was sleeping beauty. That's the way like I've heard it described. Like they laid her down as if she was sleeping beauty, almost as if that's, the last memory that they wanted to have of her, which makes me think that this is somebody who thinks pretty highly of himself, that he is incapable of, of committing such a horrible crime. And so he can't leave her in like a terrible way. His memory of her has to be like a good one. I don't know. Um, it just makes me think it's somebody who did have a thing for her, did really like her um, and you know, thought highly of themselves. I don't know. I know that sounds kind of weird. It makes sense in my mind, but um, like they just couldn't leave her in bad shape. Like that's just not the kind of person that this, that he is. Um, so I thought that that was really weird that she was like left laying down. Now Elizabeth's family, they were just, they felt so much anguish when they found out about Elizabeth being found. Um, they came back to the United States. They visited where she, her grave was. I'm going to post some pictures of them. And it's hard to look at. They're hard to see. Um, because that emotion that her family felt is really strong. Um, it's sad. Like, you just, they're so close. And the, all the hope that maybe she's out there is gone. She's not, she's not coming back. And, um... Like I said, the Hispanic community and the Hispanic families, they just love each other so much. And they just love so deeply. And um, just seeing those pictures. So I'm going to post them because I really want you to see that, that raw emotion. Uh, it's important. Like, you have to see this. That's just an important part of the story and important for us to understand. So that, you know, we're more willing to help. I don't know. If we just see the impact that these things have on other people. I think that it just makes it more human for us. And um, hopefully these kinds of things don't happen anymore because of it. But um, even though like it was really tragic for them to find Elizabeth, it also meant now they are going to hopefully get some answers. Now they're going to know, you know, how she died, when she died, all this information. And so they, you know, send off her body. They, they wait for these forensics tests and these, these tests take a long time. And in fact, it wasn't until this year that they got back the very last of her, um, of the results for her, um, the forensics results. 
and they they can't they don't know how she died um they don't know when she died like there's no evidence they've zero evidence which just is crazy to me they have no idea um because there wasn't like you know stab wounds on her bones or you know her bones weren't broken you know there wasn't like serious damage to her skull anything like that it, it makes me think that she was probably strangled but I'm, that's just one of my theories um, I might go into my theories and try to decide if I'm going to share what I'm thinking with that. But, um, yeah, it's just kind of a heartbreaking thing because there's no answers. Um, they hired a private investigator. His name is Jason Jensen. And you can just see that he is so dedicated to Elizabeth's case. And at one point, um, he talks about this penny that he found. And I am trying to kind of get some answers on when he found the penny. It sounds like he does believe that penny belonged to Elizabeth's murderer and it was left where her grave was. Now, I'm curious if the penny was found before her family came to the graveside or if it was after, because I think it's just possible maybe somebody dropped it out of their pocket, but he believes that the murderer left it there or dropped it there. So um, I think that they sent that penny in for, um, to kind of get looked at. I'm not sure if there's been any results on the penny. I'm really curious about that. And if I do find out, I will definitely talk about it because Elizabeth's case is unsolved still to this day. And I think that we need to keep her face out there and her story out there so that maybe it will be resolved eventually because somebody knows something. Somebody saw something. Somebody's heard something. Uh, somebody did something. And maybe eventually their conscience will like allow them to own up to what they've done because you're going to get caught. I promise. Like, it, it's going to happen. And um, so anyways, so that penny seems like it's an important part of everything. Also, another clue, I guess, or another lead that they had. It's kind of an interesting lead. I don't know what has come of it. Um, but there was, I think, one source on this lead saying that she was at the Kelly Grove Pavilion the Saturday before she went missing. Now, the Kelly Grove Pavilion is a place where they do, like, a lot of, like, church activities, um, things like that. But it is actually located in Hobble Creek Canyon, which is where Elizabeth was found. So, I think I may have said Cobble Creek Canyon earlier in my video, and if I did, I apologize. Um... But I think it's Hobble Creek Canyon. And I believe that is where, yeah, so they're in the same spot. So it is interesting. And that would, to me, not that's not a coincidence that she had just been in that canyon. That canyon's like a half an hour away, right around roughly a half an hour from where she lived, you know, maybe 25 minutes. Um, so, and, you know, she'd only been there for, uh, you know, less than three weeks. So I think that it would be interesting that maybe she did. She did go to that place for a church activity, which would make me wonder if maybe it's somebody at that activity that, you know, would have brought her back there. So I think that's interesting. It makes you wonder who was at that activity that she felt like she knew and trusted. I don't know. I have some ideas on that. I'm not going to say what I think or who I think, but I do think that Elizabeth did get into the car with somebody she she felt that was a friend that she knew she did. She felt like she trusted that person. I think that that person picked her up without the intention of hurting her, um, but with the capability, obviously, of hurting her. I think this is somebody who thinks highly of themselves, who feels like that they're not, they don't realize that they're capable of that, maybe, or don't want to think that they're capable of something like that. Um, and I think that they, they hit on her. He hit on her. And I think that Maybe he, like, made a move on her. It startled her. I don't know. Startled him. Upset him. And he ended up, like, you know, murdering her because he was rejected and just couldn't handle that rejection. And then, I don't know. Like I said, I, I think it's really strange. I think that, you know, I don't think the intention necessarily was there to hurt her. I think it was more to, like, hit on her and then it just all went really wrong. That's what I think happened. Um, I think that this person is probably an overachiever. This person probably was involved with her search. I think this person was um, 
yeah, I think this person, you know, thinks pretty highly of themselves. I've already said that a few times, but, uh, yeah, I think this person's probably an overachiever. And I'm actually going to go back and look at some video and things and really, like, dig into it the more I think about it. But, yeah, her story is sad. It's not solved. Nobody knows what the heck happened to Elizabeth. There are still no answers. And the thing is, is that there are answers. They're out there. So we need to keep Elizabeth's story out there. I love seeing there's a lot of people who are involved in her case, who are involved and in, invested in finding a resolution. And I do believe that there will be a resolution in Elizabeth's case. I really, truly think so. I would not be surprised to hear that they have a suspect in mind, that they have not named the suspect. Because even with Josh Powell, they never actually told him or told anyone that he was a suspect, but he absolutely was. And I think that that may be the case in Elizabeth's case. I think they probably have a, a good idea. Like I said, there's only so many people that they could interview. Um, I think they have a pretty good idea of what they think happened um, or who they think did it. I just think that it's like really like linking everything together and getting all those puzzle pieces before they can actually move forward with that. But yeah, I wouldn't be at all surprised to hear that they probably have a good idea of who did it. Um, there have been also talk about um, Sherry Black. She was murdered. Um, I think she had like a little shop. She was murdered like 10 years ago and they used DNA and they were actually able to find her murderer. And it's kind of interesting because the guy that murdered her was actually living in the same um, like really close to the same apartments that um, Elizabeth lived at the same time. And so people were really trying to find that connection there. It does not sound like they believe that there's a connection there, but it was definitely something worth investigating. Um, I would be really shocked if they were like, oh yeah, that guy also murdered Elizabeth. I don't think so. I think that they probably know though. I mean, I'd be really surprised if they don't have some idea, but that's Elizabeth's story. It is... Just one that I'm always, always going to think about. I love Elizabeth. Um, I don't know. I I hope that I can do something to, to help make it different. But yes, if you see her story out there, share it. Share it, share it like wildfire because that is important. That is going to help. And if you know anything, please do the right thing. Don't be scared. I don't think that they have any intention on sending anybody back to Mexico if you're not supposed to be here, supposedly. Like, I, and I think that's one thing that they're thinking a lot, that somebody knows something, but they're just afraid. And that's not fair. Uh, I think that you should be safe. I think that you should feel safe here. And I think that, um, yeah, I think that you're important to the story. And so if you know something, please please do the right thing for Elizabeth and for her family. Plus, this person could hurt other people. Um, they're capable of it. So you might be that, you might be that uh, link to keep that from happening. I hope this story touched you. I hope it touched you like it did me. Um, and you guys, we're going to make a difference for Elizabeth, I swear. <sighs> Okay, thank you for hanging out with me tonight. Like I said, make sure you subscribe, that you leave a comment. If you have thoughts on this, this case or if you feel like I miss a detail that's important um, or you have theories of your own, drop those theories in the comments. I'm interested to hear what you have to say. And yeah, have a good night, you guys.